I began a new series of talks last week, Here's Your Sign. We're looking at the signs or the miracles recorded in John's gospel. He calls them signs because they point to the glory and the deity of Jesus. The focus is on Jesus, not the miracle. And last week we started with the one uh, in John chapter 2, Jesus turning water into wine. Somebody told me about their church back in Alabama. They had a children's sermon, and the children were around the pastor, and he asked them, what's your favorite Bible story? And one little girl raised her hand, and he called on her, and she said, I like the story where Jesus turned the wine into grape juice. <laughs> and it was a Baptist church after all. Now, that's not exactly what happened, but you, you were here last time. You heard the story. Well, we come today to the second of the signs, and interestingly, it also happened in Cana of Galilee. Turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And if you are new to our church, in your program, there's a listening guide. And you can have that out if you'd like and take some additional notes. What God says to you and the words that I use. And maybe you'll walk away with something you can keep and apply this coming week. We'll be looking at several passages in the Bible, and not all of them will be on the screen. So if you've got a Bible, a literal Bible on your computer or in or a book with pages in it, have that out, and you can look those passages up too. John chapter 5, beginning, John chapter 4, beginning at verse 46. Once more, Jesus visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one o'clock in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son lives. So he and his whole, his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. This is God's word for God's people today. Thanks be to God. If I were to ask you, what time is it? That would be an easy question for you to answer because you're either wearing a watch or you've got a phone or you could turn around and look at the wall back there. That's up there for me. It's easy to know what time it is. It is uh, exactly 11, uh, 10.30, headed toward 11. Now, it's easy for us, but it hasn't always been easy to know what time it is. 150 years ago in America, if I asked what time is it, well, we'd have all kinds of answers. Because in those days, every town had its own time based on the sun. Every town, every village had its own time. And so it was impossible to synchronize or to know what was going on in people's lives. Nowadays, we know that if it's 10.30 here, it's 9.30 in Texas, it's 8.30 in Colorado, it's 7.30 in California. We understand that. But years ago, they didn't have that understanding until the railroad came. Stephen Ambrose says that the two greatest events of the 19th century were the Civil War and the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. That changed everything. East and West now joined together. You could move people and produce easily. It unified the nation, except for that matter of time. There were 300 different time zones in America. Now, that made it difficult for the trains because if you bought a ticket in Chicago and you were going west, how do you know when you're going to arrive? How could you tell anybody what time to meet you at the station? 
And because tracks were shared, there could have been tragedy when two trains met head on. And so the railroad came together and devised the concept of time zones. Originally, there were a hundred, and that didn't work so well either. In November 1883, they came up with the four time zones, standard time in America. And there you see the various zones. Makes life so much easier. Now you can communicate. If you are conscious of the time, you can send birthday greetings across the ocean. You can contact your friends. You can pray, and you know that your prayer is answered. You see, when it comes to prayer, and that's what we're talking about today, when it comes to miracles, time and distance don't matter at all. Jesus was a miracle worker, and he healed many people. Didn't heal everybody but he healed countless numbers of people. He would do it with a word. He'd say it and it happened. Sometimes he would do it with a touch. Now, he didn't have to touch anybody. He could do it with just his word, but he touched primarily lepers. He touched them because nobody else did. Nobody ever would touch a leper. He would use words. He would use touch. Sometimes people would touch him and the miracle happened. And then on some occasions, he did the dramatic. There was a blind man, and we'll talk about him in a future sermon. There was a blind man, and Jesus spit on the ground and made some mud and put it on the blind man's eyes, and the blind man was able to see. Jesus could heal in any number of ways, and he could do it long distance. This man comes to Jesus and begs him to come to his house, but Jesus didn't need to. With just a word, long distance, the answer came. We don't know exactly who this official is. He's, he has some position in the bureaucracy. He might have been very close to the king. He was a man of authority, and he comes to Jesus. He comes to Jesus out of great need and I submit to you that's when you will come to him. I mean, it's possible you're not, you're not that religious a person and you don't pray that often, but I'll tell you when you do pray, you pray when your back is up against the wall, when somebody's in the emergency room, when somebody is near death. We all do it. We all pray. And this, this man comes in desperation to Jesus. His son is close to death. And this father loves his son. And so he asked Jesus for a miracle. There's a story similar to this in Matthew's gospel. I want you to turn over there if you've got a Bible in hand. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. And some scholars believe it's the same moment just told in a different way. And I'll let you decide about that. Matthew chapter 8 verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him. Well, now that's different. Here's an army man. The other man was a, was a uh, politician. He was in the civic government. A centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lie. Well, in, the, in our story, it's the man's son. Here, it's his servant. My servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. Now that's different. This man says, no, you don't need to come. Just say the word. In our story, the man's begging Jesus to come to his house. I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I've not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then he said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Now that's similar, 
but a little different. There's another story also with some differences in Luke chapter 7. You can look that one up this afternoon. Luke 7, beginning at verse 7. But out of great need, and you've been there, you've had a child sick with a fever, and you were desperate, you prayed. Now, this man comes to Jesus with great humility and persistence, and that's how you've got to come. If you're going to come, come with humility and persistence. This is an important figure. Again, we don't know his exact position, but the word used in the original language indicates he's pretty high up. And Jesus, well, Jesus, as far as they knew, you know better, but as far as they knew, he was just a preacher. He was just an itinerant, traveling rabbi. That's all. And so this man humbles himself to appeal to Jesus. Maybe he's never had to do anything like that before. But again, he's desperate. So he humbles himself. Remember the Old Testament story of Naaman? The soldier, Naaman was a great man, and the scripture goes to great lengths to describe him to us in 2 Kings chapter 5. But the scripture says he was a great man, a good man, but he was a leper. And being a leper meant his career was over. He wasn't advancing. Nobody could get near him. And yet there was a servant girl in that area, who, a girl, just a child, who said, there's somebody back in my home who could help you the prophet of God. And so Naaman went and the prophet of God said, here's what you need to do. You need to go out to the muddy Jordan River and dip seven times and you'll be made well. Well, Naaman expected something much more complicated than that, something much more uh, difficult than that. He's offended that it's something so simple and that he's got to get in the muddy water. And he almost walked away from a miracle. Because it didn't sound like what he thought a miracle would be. But reluctantly, he did what the prophet said. And he was made whole. You got to humble yourself. And when you're in great need, that's when you realize that you're no better than anybody else. That's an important lesson to learn. All of us, regardless of our race, our ethnicity, where we live, our economic standing... All of us are 99.5 or 0.6% the same. There's just a little bit of difference. And we let those little differences become so large in our minds. We're all of us in need. All of us with our children. We cherish their future. And we are all of us mortal. And we realize that our money can't buy a healing. That nothing in our hands we bring. We simply cling to Jesus so he humbles himself and he begs Jesus the the force of the language here he hears that Jesus is there he went to him and begged him and in the original language it's continuous action he keeps on doing it because at first it looks like Jesus isn't going to answer look at what he says in verse 48 unless you people see signs and wonders Jesus told him you will never believe and it's almost like the royal official interrupts and says sir I understand all that but please can you come down and help my son before he dies Jesus seems to be putting him off just like last week When Mary, his mother, mentions the wine and Jesus says, Woman, what have I to do with this? My hour has not come. It's like he's putting her off. And yet he comes around and does the miracle, turning the water into wine. He's going to do it here. But the man has to wait a little bit. He keeps on asking. He refuses to give up. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, one of my favorite Bible stories, chapter 18. You know, the parables are not always explained to us. Jesus would tell a story and then just kind of walk away, leaving people with question marks over their heads, trying to figure out what he meant. And, And to those it was given, they got it, the others never did. But sometimes a parable is so important, we're not left to wonder one bit. We're told exactly what it's about, and this is one of them. Luke 18, verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable, here it is, to show them that they should always pray 
and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And I don't know what kind of judge he was if he didn't fear God or care about people, but he's got the job. He's making decisions every day. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. A widow. Now, to be a widow in that day and time, that place was to be totally destitute. If you didn't have children who could take care of you, you had no social safety net. You were destitute. And that's this woman. And something has happened. And so she's appealing to this judge over and over again. She's not asking for anything special. Notice what he says. She's simply asking for justice against my adversary. And every time the judge walks out there, all rise, he looks and she's on the front row. And if not there, she's out in the hallway. If not there, she's under a stairwell. She's always there pleading for justice. Any of you watch Judge Judy on television? She comes on late in the afternoon. Sometimes I'm home. Audrey will walk in and see me watching Judge Judy, and she'll say, why are you watching that? And I'll say, because Maury is on the other channel, and I'd rather watch Judge Judy. But I don't like Judge Judy. I think she's rude. I, I, I think she's too quick to silence people who are just trying to tell their story. I think of her when I read this story. This judge doesn't care about God, doesn't care about people. But look at what the text says. For some time, verse 4, he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though, and this is a, a literary device, the story is being told. And so for a second time, we're reminded of the character of this guy. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. What he's literally saying is, I'm afraid she is so intent on this, she's liable to beat me up. She, she might give me a black eye. Maybe she's not as weak and frail as I've pictured her. She's maybe a very strong woman, and she won't give up. The answer comes and justice is done. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. If you ask and seek and knock, the answer will come. We're being told here to be persistent. If you don't get the answer right away, don't give up, but keep on praying. I like what Susan Sparks says. She says you need to pray like you're a telemarketer. They call your house too? They won't take no. You try to be polite for a minute or two, and they won't, they won't give up. They, they keep coming at you from every direction. Pray like that. In the story, I don't want to leave without, uh, without saying this about the story in Luke chapter 18. Uh, sometimes when we read a parable, we try to make every person stand for somebody. Now, you are the woman in the story. I am the woman. I am the person in great need. And so we assume that the judge is God, but he isn't. Because again, we're told the character of this judge is not, nothing like God at all. Doesn't care about God, doesn't care about people. That's not our God. Reluctant to do anything, that's not our God. He loves us and he calls us to himself. He's the opposite of God. And so come boldly, pray persistently and believe. And doing all of that, this is number three on your listening guide. Sometimes we leave with only a promise. Jesus had said, this generation, you people demand a sign. Well, this guy doesn't even get that. He walks away with nothing. Look at what the text says back in John 4. Go, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. That's all he's got, a promise. And a promise is only as good as the character of the one giving it. A lot of people make promises, 
But you have to look at the character behind the promise before you could ever take it to the bank. We're holding on to the promise of God. Romans, quickly, if you'll turn there, Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, a recounting of the story of Abraham and Sarah. And you remember they were promised they would have a child and it was a fantastic promise because they were elderly, beyond elderly. But look at verse 18 of chapter 4. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. And here's the verse, verse 21, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. And yes, indeed he does. If he says it, You can depend on it. And so this man has his word. That's all. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, well, it was yesterday at about one in the afternoon. The fever left him. Then the father realized that that was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. You got to believe that he's heard you, that he's heard your prayer. That's what this man does. He knows that he got a hearing from Jesus. And when you pray, he hears you pray. I know sometimes it doesn't seem like he does, but no prayer is lost. He heard you. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 24. Before they call, I will answer. While they are speaking, I will hear. And Jeremiah 33, 3, we all know. Call unto me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. He hears you and something else. The answer is on the way. The answer is on the way. If you can find it quickly, go over to Daniel in the Old Testament, near the end of your Old Testament scripture. Daniel chapter 9. And it's a complicated chapter about uh, prophecy, and we don't have time to go into all of that. But I want you to see how it comes to Daniel. Chapter 9, verse 20. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, you know who Gabriel is? An angel, one of the top angels, but here he's called a man. Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, he came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Do you hear what he said? Daniel prays. He confesses his sin. He's seeking God. And suddenly there's the angel Gabriel, and Gabriel tells him, the minute you opened your mouth, I began my journey with the answer. He hears you, and he sends the answer. Now, sometimes the answer gets hung up. I I think that's that's an example of spiritual conflict and spiritual warfare out there. Sometimes those angels have to do battle with evil forces to get to us, but they come God heard you all the while, and the answer has been sent. He's met by his servants back now in John chapter 4, and uh, they tell him, your son lives. And he asks the question, well, when did he start getting better? 
And the servants say, well, it was yesterday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And the man realizes, that's when I was talking to Jesus. A coincidence? I don't think so. It's how God works. Now, scholars have had trouble, a little trouble with this. 1 o'clock in the afternoon. There's about a 20-mile difference between where Jesus is and where the sun is. 20 miles. So, it would have been possible for him to have gone straight home and not wait a day to get there. Now, it's possible that he delayed because he went full throttle to get to Jesus in the first place. He was exhausted, as was his horse. That's true. But it might be something else here. He took Jesus at his word. He saw no need to rush home. He knew when he got there, he'd find his son alive. Quiet confidence and trust. Do you have that kind of trust in the word of God, the promise of God? I know you worry. We all do. We worry about things we can change and things impossible to change. We pray and we don't get an answer right away. God wants you to have peace that as you pray, he hears and begins to send the answer. I love that promise in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Do not worry about anything. Don't be anxious for anything. But in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's what we're talking about. That quiet confidence that keeps you going. Let's pray together. Would you bow with me, please? We're going to sing in a moment, and I'm going to invite anybody who's ready to present herself for membership. You've, you've been coming week after week. You feel at home here. You'd like to be a part of us. We'd like for you to be. Just step out and come to me. I'll be standing right at the front. Maybe recently you've given your heart to Christ. You have invited him to be your Savior and you need to let us know. We want to baptize you, not today, but sometime in the near future. But you need to take a stand. So you come. Or if you want somebody to pray with you about anything, it'd be our privilege. Lord, speak to your people now and call people to yourself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.